Today, we're going to be dealing with the Old Testament historical books of First and Second Kings. Next week, we will deal with First and Second Chronicles. And I'm going to make every effort to have for you next week everything you need to know about the class, the uh, study document, so that you can be preparing for the test. Then week six, we're going to deal with Ezra, Nehemiah, and the rebuilding. Actually, next week when we talk about First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles retell some of the stories from Samuel and Kings. Not all of them, but a much more formal. Chronicles, the word chronicle tends to mean a more formal, uh, like a government record of things. And so the, the books of Chronicles tell some of the same historical content from Samuel and Kings, but do it in a much more formal way. Particularly, for instance, um, they, they were from the southern kingdom of Judah, not the northern kingdom of Israel, and so they make almost no reference to the northern kingdom of Israel. All of the content about the kings that ruled are the kings who ruled in Judah in the south. And we'll talk about that north-south thing in a few minutes. Then Ezra and Nehemiah, the task of rebuilding, Ezra and Nehemiah are the books about when the Persian Empire had gained control of then the the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean world, and gave the Jews, King Cyrus the Great gave the Jews the freedom to return home. It's Ezra and Nehemiah, which was one book in the original uh, Hebrew, still is in the Tanakh. Uh, that's the story of the return, of Jews returning back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the, the city walls. And then the last week, two weeks, uh, three weeks from now, the book of Esther, a, a wonderful little book, again, about the period of time of the Persian Empire, and we'll talk about that. Esther almost didn't make it into our Bible. Does anybody know why? Because uh, God is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. There's no mention of, the, of God at all in the book of Esther. There's no reference to God. But it is so much the story of the Jewish people, and of even though it doesn't say God, of God's preservation of them in miraculous ways, that... It was decided that even though it doesn't talk about God, and some people have questioned it, that it definitely does belong in Scripture. Okay? So we'll look at that, the first half of week seven. Following the review of Esther, we will take our final exam. And you're all going to take the final exam, right? Yes. Good, good. Um, we've looked at this each week because it is a good survey of the sections of the Old Testament, the first five books of the law, or Torah. Then, and this is the breakdown according to the English version. The Jewish version is broken out differently. Uh, we have then the books of the, the history books. We, of course, are in First and Second Kings this week. Then the books of wisdom, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. That will be the next Old Testament class we have after this one. It will be the last of the Old Testament survey uh, kinds of classes because we've already dealt with the others. And then the prophets. There are five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. So, a um, breakdown of how the English Bible is seen in terms of structure. When I first started teaching Old Testament survey, I taught it according to the Hebrew or the Jewish outline, and I think people just got confused. Because, uh, for instance, when we talk about this being the history books, according to the Hebrew designations, Judges, uh, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings are um, the former prophets. They're considered prophetical books, and we'll talk about why they are seen as pro uh, prophetic books a little bit later here. Okay? Any questions about any of that? All right. Let's talk a little bit about first, generally, about the books of First and Second Kings. These two books, as I'm sure you know, because you've all read them, right? Right. Okay. The, these two books trace the history of Israel and Judah. That is the two kingdoms. Now it starts out with the united monarchy. The united monarchy started under Saul, which we read about in uh, Samuel. And then when Saul um, sinned against God and was removed from authority, David was put in his place. And it is the story of David in 2 Samuel. So those were the two first kings of the united monarchy. And then... We pick up here in 1 Kings, the very first uh, part of 1 Kings, David is a very old man. He's such an old man, he can't get warm. You all know old people like that, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not asking for volunteers, David. That's okay. You don't have to. Um, so, could not get warm. And so they find a beautiful young woman 
to um, sleep with him and keep him warm. Now, there's no indication that she was a concubine or anything. In fact, it said David does not have relations with her. David did not know her, use the biblical term. But uh, that she was a beautiful woman, and she was there mainly just so he'd have some body heat. So he's a very old man at that point, and we have the, the accession of his son Solomon after an older one of David's sons, Adonijah, tries uh, unsuccessfully to take over and become king at the end of his father David's life. And David had promised Bathsheba and Solomon that Solomon would be his successor as king. And so all of that happens. We'll talk a little bit more detail as we get into it. But uh, Solomon becomes king. Solomon was the third and last king of the United Kingdom. That is the United Monarchy, which included all of the 12 tribes of Israel and all of the land of the Promised Land that they had conquered. Solomon, who started out right on track, in fact, Solomon uh, pleases God greatly when early in his kingship, when he's still a very young man, apparently, God asks Solomon in a dream, what gift do you want me to give you? I will give you whatever gift you ask for. And Solomon says, I want wisdom to be able to rule your people. You know, your people have become so large, it's such a big job, and I am so young, I need wisdom in order to know how to take care of the responsibility of being the leader of your people. And God responds by saying, because you have asked for this, not for wealth, not for your enemies to be defeated, not for a long life, I will give you what you've asked for, and that is wisdom to rule, and I will give you all the other things as well. I will give you wealth, I will give you long life, I will give you victory over your enemies. But God was very pleased with that. Unfortunately, Solomon asked for wisdom to be able to rule the Jewish people, and he didn't ask for wisdom to know how to get along with women. <coughs> because the women are the ones that get him in trouble. He ends up marrying foreign wives, something that they were not supposed to do. You know, he is apparently he really likes the ladies. Solomon really likes the ladies. He ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. A concubine is like a slave with benefits. Okay, or to friends with benefits. Um, so a thousand women in his court, either wives or concubines, many of them he uh, was attracted to and married from the surrounding areas, the Moabites, the Ammonites, etc., the, the peoples that still surrounded the nation of, of Israel. And most of those worshipped other gods, and they ended up over time convincing Solomon to worship other gods. First, Solomon gave in to giving them places to worship their gods, Moloch and Chemosh and various others, the worship of whom were quite horrible. As I've said many times, it involved child sacrifice, it involved all sorts of things, and most especially, though, it was not worship of the one true God. Well, Solomon let his, his 700 wives and 300 concubines do that, then he actually built places of worship for them, and then ultimately he himself apparently was involved in this pagan worship. Well, because God had promised David that he would not do to David or David's son, Solomon, what he had done to Saul, and that is remove him from the situation when he displeased him, he said uh, the promise that God had given David was that I, your descendants will sit on your throne, and I, if, if, he does, if your son does something wrong, I will not do what I did with Saul and remove him, but rather he will be, he'll suffer the punishment at, by the rods of men. In other words, he'll, 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 he may have to pay the consequences for his own failings according to how people respond to him, according to what people do or don't do in obedience to him, but I will not intercede and take him out of the picture like I did Saul. Well, sure enough, Solomon, because he offended God at Solomon's death, his son, Rehoboam, ended up taking control only of Judah, the tribe of the south, Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin, you will remember from our studies, was the smallest of all the tribes at that point because they had been, they had been decimated in a rebellion against the others in the judges. And so there weren't that many Benjamites left. Saul had been a Benjamite, but there weren't that many Benjamites left. It was almost entirely the tribe of Judah, the largest tribe which lived in the south, that uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam ended up being responsible for. And so they called it the Kingdom of Judah. A political rival, Rehobo, or, uh, Jeroboam, steps up and claims the right to lead the, the north, ten northern tribes, that is the ten minus 
the 12 minus Judah and the Benjamin. So he ends up becoming king of the north. You've got two kingdoms, the king of, uh, kingdom of Judah in the south, which was predominantly the tribe of Judah. The kingdom of Israel, they called it, in the north, because the other ten tribes were all involved in that. So you have two kingdoms, starting with Solomon's son Rehoboam and his rival Jeroboam, the kingdom splits in two at that point. And the book of First and Second Kings are the story of the very last days and death of David, the installment of Solomon against opposition as king, the life of Solomon, and he did some spectacular things. He, for instance, built the temple, the great temple of, of Jerusalem. And built a grand palace. He expanded the boundaries, the economic capability. He made uh, Israel rich in his day, but then because he sinned against God, the kingdom split after his death. And the rest of the end of 1 Kings and all of 2 Kings is the story of the various kings that then ruled in the north, the, in the kingdom of Israel, and in the south, the kingdom of Judah. Interestingly enough, God's promise to David that your descendants will sit on the throne that promise was maintained in the south, in Judah. Every one of the, the kings who ruled in the south were of the line of David. There were no other dynasties, no other uh, families that took over. Whereas in the north, uh, it was chaos. And they, would be, uh, they would have a king, and the king would have a son, and then that son would be overthrown. And then there would be a new king from a completely different family line, and then that king would be overthrown. And the new king who would overthrow the past king would have a son, and the, the father and son would rule, and then that son would get overthrown. You know, they changed, um, I think it's nine times, seven times, nine times, they changed dynasties in the north, and they didn't even last as long as the southern kingdom did, because the north was so bad that God stepped in, sent the Assyrians, and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted about 150 years longer to 586 when they were destroyed finally by the Babylonians. We're going to get into that, but I wanted to give you kind of an overall picture of what we're looking at here when we talk about First and Second Kings. Now, interestingly enough, they haven't been always been called First and Second Kings. When it was in the original Hebrew version, it was one book called the Book of Kings. Then, in the, the 300, th the third century rather, when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Septuagint. All the scholars gathered, 70 scholars, the tradition has it gathered in Alexandria to translate the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, into Greek because a lot of Jewish people no longer understood Hebrew. They no longer could read Hebrew because of the influence of Alexander the Great. So they translated it into Greek. When they translated it into Greek, they actually took 1st and 2nd Samuel, what we know of, which was called the Book of Samuel, and the Book of Kings, and they created what they called the four books of the kingdoms. There was the first book of kingdoms, which we would call 1 Samuel. The second book of kingdoms, which we would call 2 Samuel. The third book of kingdoms, which we call Kings, 1 Kings. And the fourth book of, of the kingdoms, which we would call 2 Kings. Which, the reason, very simply, is because all four of these books have to do with the royal, um, the, the establishment of the monarchy, and then the development of the monarchy, the unified monarchy, and then the splitting up and a bunch of different kings in the north and south. Later on, when the Latin Vulgate came along, they split it up into 1st first, first Samuel, 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, primarily because it was just too much to handle at one time, you know, the, having all of that on one scroll. So, we have the books of 1st Kings and 2nd Kings. Let's talk about 1st Kings a little bit. We are not... Um, we, we don't have an identified author for the book of 1 Kings. The Jewish tradition is that it was Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was alive in the right period of time because we know that after the fall, if you read the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentation, Lamentations, which Jeremiah wrote, they all have to do with the fall of Jerusalem. Well, the fall of Jerusalem happened in 586. And so we believe that in all, all of those same kinds of events, the same time period is covered in 1 and 2 Kings. So it's not impossible that it was Jeremiah, but nowhere in either one of these books does it identify the author as having been Jeremiah. So we don't know that for sure, but it's traditionally the prophet Jeremiah. If this is true, then he would have written 1st and 2nd Kings, he would have written the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations. Okay? We believe it was written somewhere around 550 BC, and the reason we say that is because it, it 
not only covers the period of time of the kings of the north and south, it also, we know it has to go past 586 because it has to do with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, the, the captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and the very last part of 2 Kings. Remember, these were one book at one point, so the same author, um, or at least the, there's a continuity there. If there were multiple authors that were ordained by God, called by God to do this, then, then they, there was a continuity anyway. The last thing that's covered at the end of 2 Kings is the release of Jehoiakim, who had been the king that was captured, He's taken off into captivity in Babylon and is imprisoned in Babylonia, and they, but then they release him, and he is released. He, it says he sat aside his prison clothes, he was given nice clothes to wear, he was allowed to eat at the king's table, and honored among all the other kings that the Babylonian king had conquered, that had become sort of uh, either friends or vassals, and that he was even given an allowance, he was given a regular allotment of money. So we know that it's later, it's after 586, far enough down the line after 586, that the king, who had been taken into prison from the Babylonian, start of the Babylonian exile, has been there for, for a, a number of years and has then been released. In fact, I think it actually says 36 years that he'd been in prison when he gets released. Well, if this was written right at that time, because Joe, the, the release of Jehoiakim is the last thing in 2 Kings, then that would put it right at 550 B.C., so somewhere around there, okay? By the way, Bob, I did a little research, and there is archaeological evidence for King David. They have found a, a stone, an inscribed stone, that talks about the defeat of the descendants of David who ruled over uh, part of Israel. So, we do have archaeological evidence um, of the existence of King David. Not a lot, but we do have. It. Okay, I just wanted to tell you that because you asked that question the other day. Um, can I, can I? Yes? It says um, the kings were buried with their fathers in the tomb in the city of David. So wouldn't that be because the book, oh, again, it's the Bible in the mind. <laughs> There's people that dispute that. Well, I was going to say over and over and over it's in the city of David that they but we don't have those access to those tombs anymore. There is a place, there is a tomb in Jerusalem now that is the traditional burial place of King David. I mean, they call it the tomb of King David. But we don't know for sure that that's King David who's buried here. Uh, so in terms of archaeological evidence, that's a traditional site, and there is a burial place there, but we don't know for sure that that's David in there. Not like we can test his DNA and compare it to his descendants because we don't know who those are. Uh, when Jesus comes back, we could do that then, but you know, not until then. Um, as long as there was a throne to occupy, then David's descendants occupied it. With the destruction of the kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians, there no longer was a throne to occupy. And as we talked about before, I think Mike commented on this, when the, sometime later, like almost 600 years later, A.D. 70, after Jesus' death, when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem for a second time, the Babylonians destroyed it in 586 and burned the temple. Later on, Herod the Great rebuilt the temple. And then in AD 70, the Romans come along again, and they destroy the temple, and they destroy Jerusalem because of a rebellion. Well, when they destroyed Jerusalem, they did a much more effective job. They destroyed all the genealogical records, all the family histories, all the everything. So with the exception of uh, some names that we know have been, pa been passed down for you know, two or 3,000 years, <clears throat> where we can identify people as belonging to certain families. I mentioned Cohen is, is a Levitical name. Somebody has the name Cohen today, it means that they are almost certainly descended from the tribe of Levi. But we don't have a lot of those kind of pointers. And so we couldn't find a descendant of David. I'm sure that there are some living today, because when the kingdom of Judah fell, you know, the, the, all, the, all the kings of Judah had been descendants of David, and all of their families, and probably is a very large clan at that point. But we have no way of tracking any of that anymore, right? Interestingly enough, there was a tribe... There's a tribe of Jews that came down from Saudi Arabia and then down the coast, the, the uh, east coast of Africa, that settled in South Africa and maintained, maintained Jewish traditions and so on. And they, uh, they were able to track them to see if they were truly Jews by, by backtracking genetically a defect that occurred in, the, in all the descendants of Arab. Well, there is distinctive Jewish DNA. For instance, the Falangist Jews in Ethiopia um, have. Jewish genetic markers. And 
to be a Jew means to belong to that religion, but it also means to be of a genetic history. And there are there are diseases which only Jewish people can get. Tay-Sachs is a is a disease that only somebody of Jewish heritage can get. So there is a very distinctive genetic marker for Judaism, and there are there are pockets of Jews all over the world. When the Falangist Jews in Ethiopia, and they are Black African Jews, but they were, I mean, and, and the tradition goes that when the Queen of Sheba, who some some say the Queen of Sheba was from Arabia, um, some say that she's from Ethiopia. The Ethiopian tradition is that the Queen of Sheba was Ethiopian. When she came to visit Solomon. Um, and that's, that story is contained here in the books of Kings. When the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon, and Solomon was at, it was the height of the uh, kingdom of Israel, of, the, the, of all of Israel, that's not the southern kingdom. The wealth, the wisdom, the, the learning, everything about it, the Queen of Sheba was really impressed, and she came from a pretty substantial kingdom herself. Um, if she was Ethiopian, probably would have represented the kingdom of Aksum, which was a great kingdom in, in uh, northeastern Africa. Um, this, the legend is, the story is that when she been, went back to Ethiopia, she was pregnant with Solomon's child. And given Solomon's inclinations, that's not impossible to believe, um, but that at any rate, that if that was the case, and then there were descendants there, or if there, there continued to be traffic in between um, the Holy Land, you know, the, the land of the Hebrew people, and the, the land of the people of North Africa, then there may have been other progeny from that, those relationships. Those, that kind of relationship between Ethiopia and uh, Israel continued in the New Testament times. You will remember the story of Philip, who's walking along, Philip the uh, deacon and evangelist, and he comes upon an Ethiopian in a chariot. And the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian eunuch, is a representative of the, the, the queen of Ethiopia. He's a member of her court, and he has come to uh, the land the, of the Jews for, who knows, political connections, whatever. There apparently were, at various times, the Jewish peoples would recruit mercenaries from North Africa. Um, and so there, were, there was a presence of North African people there then. So there's all kinds of connections like that. But it's true that they, there are clear genetic markers that link people back to, to a Jewish, uh, some Jewish heritage in their past. And there are people all over, uh, literally all over the world, pockets of people who claim Jewish ancestry, claim to be connected to the line of King David or whatever, we can prove whether or not they do have Jewish Jewish roots. So. Can I just ask a question? Sure. If King David, uh, Solomon had a son, starts off with David <coughs> old and gold. And at that point, his oldest sons had been Absalom and Amnon, both of whom have been killed. Right? Um, Amnon was killed by Absalom for raping Amnon's half-sister, the full sister of, of Absalom. And then Absalom re rebels is brought back, runs again, they have a, a, a war, and Absalom is killed by Joab. You know, when he runs forward, he's got this huge head of hair, and he gets stuck in the trees uh, as he's riding underneath the tree limbs, and he's hanging there, and Absalom comes up and stabs him. So the two oldest sons have died. The next son by age is Abinadab, who is the, the one who, in the start of 1 Kings, declares himself king while David is still alive. Now, I think Seth, you asked this question the other day. Was there a sense? I think it was you. That, was there uh, was there a policy that the oldest son inherited the throne? The answer is no. There may have been in other kingdoms, but realize that um, by the time David is ready to have an heir to take over as king, there's only been two kings in Israel ever. Only two. There was Saul, and his line ended because his sons were killed. Uh, he, had a, he had a grandson, but his sons were killed in the war with the Philistines after Saul was offended God. So you got David. At that point, David had the authority to name anybody he wanted as his successor. There was no law, there was no even policy that it had to be his oldest son. 
Now, Abinadab apparently thought it ought to be him because he was the oldest surviving son, and so he declares, I'm the king. Well, we don't have a record of this, but apparently there was a point earlier when, Beth, when David had promised Bathsheba that your son Solomon will become king after me. And it may have been because David's you know, continued guilt of the fact that he had intercourse with Bathsheba when she was still married to somebody else. Bathsheba bore a child, and that child died as part of the judgment against David's infidelity. And it may have been that, that because Bathsheba lost her first son, because of David's sin, that David felt an obligation to Bathsheba to promise her that her next son, Solomon, would be especially cared for. All right? I'm making that up, but it is not unreasonable that that may have been the conversation. So Bathsheba and Nathan, the prophet, when Abinadab announces that he's the new king and is having a party, never celebrate your victory while your enemies are still out there. Okay, that's the, that's the, the lesson to be learned from that one. Well, Abinadab is having this big party, so everybody hears that he's declaring himself to be king. Notice he did not, this is when the king was the primary religious leader as well. Abinadab did not ask God's opinion about this. He just said, I will be king. Even though he knew that was an issue, and we know that he knew it was an issue because the people he did not invite to his inauguration party included Nathan the prophet and others that were clearly supporters of David and David's will and therefore would have been supporters of Solomon. The, the very important people in the kingdom, the high priest, um, one, of the, one of the priests, the primary prophet, the head of the military, um, Benaiah at that point, he did not invite them because he knew they wouldn't agree with this. So he knew he was doing something wrong. He has this party. Nathan goes to Bathsheba and says, David promised that your son would be king after him, and yet Abinadab is announced. So you need to go into him, Bathsheba, and talk to him about this. Bathsheba does and says, Great Lord, my king. Do you remember that you promised that my son Solomon would be king? And David said, does. He says yes. Well, Nathan comes back in and says, afterwards, it said, Abinadab has announced himself to be king. Is that what you really want, David? And David said, no. I have sworn that it will be Solomon, therefore, and David, even though he's old and cold, as I said, he still has enough uh, oomph that he calls on all of those key people and says, I want you guys to get together, go get Solomon, put him on my mule, which was a sign of um, royal authority to ride on the king's mule and anoint him and declare him to be king. So they do so. And when Abinadab hears it, you get a pretty good indication he shouldn't have been king in the first place because he freaks, he panics. He's got a whole crowd of people who have already said they're going to support him, but instead he runs away. And he runs to the, the, the tabernacle and grabs the horns of the altar. Back in those days, the, and you can find pictures of this, they literally would have an altar where they would burn uh, wood and they would put, put sacrifice on it. On all four corners there would be these protrusions, you know, that stick out. They were called the horns of the altar. Frequently they were covered with gold. And in those days, if you were in the holy place and you grabbed the horn of the altar, there was sanctuary there. In fact, that continued into very modern times. Why do we call the building, the, the room where we worship in the church a sanctuary? You ever thought about that? Because in the olden days, if you made it to a, a place of worship, a temple or a church, you couldn't be arrested. This, this is the whole story behind the, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. The idea that if uh, somebody who's accused of a crime could make it into the cathedral, they couldn't be arrested because it was a place of sanctuary. So, Abinadab is there and he's got a hold of the horn of the, of the and they, he says, I'm not turning loose, you can't take me. And so they have to end up David steps, David gives instructions, Solomon says, all right, if you're not going to cause any more problems, I'm not going to, we're not going to do anything to you, you'll be fine, you can come out, and he did, all right? Uh, we'll talk about what he did later on, having, again, having to do with a woman, but, yes? The uh, question was raised about Solomon's 700 wives. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know when the Jews stopped observing polygamy? Well, it was never... It was never really okay. This is one of the reasons that both David and Solomon had a hard time, is both of them were polygamous. Um, the, in the book of Genesis, 
It doesn't say you can only have one wife, but what it says is that when a man and a woman marry, the woman will leave her parents and they will become one flesh, you know, and, and what God has joined together, let no one tear apart kind of thing. It doesn't say you can only have one spouse, one wife, but the clear implication by the description of the nature of that relationship is that, that that's it. You know, you become one flesh, you're tied to each other, you're, you, and the idea of having 700 people that that's the case and 300 more that you just act like it, that's something that while God allowed it, it clearly was never his intention, not from the book of Genesis on. Your question is, when did they stop allowing it? And I don't have an answer for that. I can look for it, but I don't know. Um, clearly by New Testament times, so somewhere, my guess is it probably was sometime during the exile. Um, but I don't know that. I have to look that up. So, good question. But certainly by the time they came back from the exile, the multiple wife thing was no longer the case. And again, we, it clearly got Solomon in trouble, and the idea that David lusted after Bathsheba, and as soon as her husband was dead, married her on top of all of his other wives. And it's interesting, too, you, you almost get this idea of um, serial, what would you call it? You look at a list of David's wives, and his first wife he had eight, one child with. His second wife he had one child with. His third wife he had one child with. His fourth wife he had two children with. That was, um, and on and on. And you almost get this picture that that he would see a woman like she he did with Bathsheba. He would fall. He would be smitten with her. He would marry her. They, you know, they would have conjugal relations. The woman would have a, a child. And then David would go on and get smitten with somebody else and marry them. You know, so that David didn't have 700 wives, but he has more than, uh, it lists nine by name, and then it says that there were more. Okay. So um, the, the whole picture seems to be one in which that was a problem for David, and it's a problem for Solomon. In fact, the story of Abinadab. Abinadab says, I won't cause any more problems. So Solomon says, okay, if you don't cause any problems, then you're free. And Abinadab probably knew what he would have done in, in Solomon's place. Right after that, Abinadab goes to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and says, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go in and ask Solomon if I can marry Abishag the Shunammite, who is the very the beautiful young woman that had been you know, the, the bed warmer for David. And apparently quite beautiful. Since she's not called Abishag a Shunammite, she's called Abishag the Shunammite. So she must have had some reputation for beauty. It indicates that at least. Well, there's two pieces to this, I think. One of them is that one of the characteristics, uh, one of the things that kings would do when they defeated another king frequently is take their wives. This is why when Absalom rebelled against David and David left Jerusalem, Hello. And he left behind his, um, the concubines, because David had concubines and additional wives too. He left them to take care of the palace. When Absalom takes over the palace, at the suggestion of one of his counselors, he takes the, the concubines of David up on the roof in tents. There's no indication he did this right out in the open, but not inside the building. And he has relations with all of them. Well, he did that because that was a sign of having defeated the predecessor, whose wives or concubines these were, that you now uh, completely control this situation. It was, it was a power play. And that was quite common in those days. A king would defeat another king, and he would take their wives, concubines, sometimes even their children. So when um, Abinadab comes through Bathsheba, comes to Solomon and says, May I marry Abishag the Shunammite? who, while had not, she had not been a concubine or a wife of David's, she had been, you know, the closest thing to it other than the relations part. Um, and so there's a clear sense that this is one more sort of subtle play that Abinadab is making toward claiming some kind of power, some sort of authority, to take King David's, the woman who had been his servant and the woman who warmed his bed. When Bathsheba asks her son Solomon for this, Solomon says, whatever you ask, I'll give to you. But when she actually asks it, Solomon blows up and ends up having Abinadab killed 
for having asked for that. Now, it seems like a strong reaction. First, it, it was almost certainly perceived by everybody that that would have been a power play by Benedict, so he wasn't through with his trying to take over control. But the other thing, interestingly enough, when you get into the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Psalms, it's sometimes called, which is a love, the book is about the love between a man and a woman, physical love. Uh, he writes love poetry to the Shulamite woman. As far as we can tell, Shulamite and Shunamite were the same thing. And so there is some thought that the Shunamite, Abishag the Shunamite, who was King David's bed warmer and who uh, Abinadab wanted to take as his own wife, the reason that Solomon reacted so strongly against this is not only because it was a political issue, but because he may have had affections for her himself. In fact, some of the love poetry there, and it's quite honestly, it's erotic love poetry. I mean, it doesn't use nasty words, but it talks about body parts in very poetic ways, that the woman he's writing some of those, those things to may very well have been Abishag. And by that time, he already had a crush on her. And so the idea that Abinadab, his former enemy, wanted to marry her, he blows up for political reasons and for amorous reasons. We don't know that for a fact, but the pieces all sort of fit together on that one. Okay? Don't draw too much theological implication from that. But, uh, but I think it's important to see that all these different pieces we find in Scripture, there, there are relationships, there are connections in a lot of that stuff. Okay? Marvin. Along with the question, why didn't they have more wives later on, is it took a lot of money yeah. to, pro to look, provide for all those wives, and after the exile, they weren't in a position. That's right. Uh, and that got Solomon into his other problem, which ultimately cost him the kingdom. He was so onerous on his uh, workforce that Jeroboam, who was mm -hmm. leading a portion of that, rebelled and fled to Egypt because right. uh, he said, you're, you're overworking your people, and that's why they against him. Exactly. Well, yeah, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, you remember the story where the Israelite workers from Israel, not from Judah, come to him and say, will you lighten the load? You know, cut back on what your father Solomon demanded of us. If you will, we will serve you, and it's all good. Well, his older advisors told him that's a great idea, you should do that. His younger advisors, the young Turks who were friends of his, said absolutely not. Tell them that, you know, um, if, if my father treated you with thorns, I'll treat you with scorpions, you know, um, and, and he said, it's going to be worse on you, it's going to be harder on you, they said, fine, later, you know, we're not going to serve you, and that led to the split, so it was a matter, in order to maintain his wealth, his 700 wives, 300 concubines, and everything else, another thing God told him not to do, is don't collect horses, because horses were used only for military. Anytime you read horse in the Bible, it's a military term. They were used to either draw chariots or later ridden into battle. Um, and he was told not to, and yet there's great glowing reports in Kings about all the different horses that, that uh, Solomon had brought up from Arabia and all these kinds of things. So that took a lot of money. We're told that Solomon's uh, income included 666 talents of gold per year. That's over 25 tons of gold that was given to him personally by the various areas he controlled. And so, yeah, it took a lot of money to do those things. Later on, they were not in a position to maintain that kind of lifestyle. So. Okay, uh, one of the things I think we need to realize as we talk about the book of Kings, here is the theme. We have the reign of David's son, King Solomon, the peak of Israel's power and influence, the building of the temple and palace, Solomon's decline leading to a divided kingdom. But the purpose, to show how obedience to God led to greatness for Israel, while disobedience led to disruption of the kingdom. When you read First and Second Kings, it is not like reading a usual history book. There are some kings, like Omri is one of them, that is mentioned barely. Well, politically, historically, he was one of the more important kings in terms of what happened historically during his reign. And yet, he's all barely mentioned in here. He's mentioned by name and that's all. Well, the reason for that is that these books, First and Second Kings, are not intended to be history books in the usual sense. They are listed as prophetic books by the Jews because the purpose of these books is to present a theological point. In other words, they are, make, they are speaking for God in giving an evaluation for these events. So the whole point is not what, what political things happen, not all of that. It is 
which kings and which events reflected God's will or the violation of God's will and how God reacted to all that. So there's a theological purpose behind all of this, unap unapologetically. So they're not history in the way we think of history. And again, remember, history was only invented by the Greeks right around the same time. Okay? Herodotus, and later Thucydides, um, invented history in Greece you know, during these same centuries. The, the, the Hebrews did not write history the way we think of history, and this isn't intended that way. It's intended to tell a very important, make a very important point about the theological consequences of disobeying God, how God blesses when you obey, God judges when you disobey, and ultimately, what happened to Israel in the north and Judah in the south after the kings, and, well, first, why it got divided, but later what happened to them is because of their disobedience to God. That's the point of these stories, not all the different things the various kings did and when they did it in order, okay? So that's important to remember when you read through this. Um, outline of First Kings, the simplest way is to say that the first 11 chapters are about the United Kingdom under Solomon. David's death, right away. Solomon coming to power, and then the, the uniting of the kingdom and the growth of the kingdom under Solomon. And then we'll get into a more detailed uh, outline here shortly. And then the second half is the divided kingdom after Solomon's death, when it's split between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So that's 1 Kings. Any questions about that much of it? All right. 1 Kings 9. This has to do with the building of the temple. David had asked God to, to allow him to be the one to build the temple. David said, we live in houses of cedar and you, Lord, live in a tent that you've resided in since we were out in the desert. And David said, I don't think that's right. I want to build you a house. And at first, Nathan the prophet then said, fine. But then when he went home, God gave a vision to Nathan and said, no, David is not the one who's going to build my temple because he's a man of blood. David had fought so many wars and been involved in so much killing, even though he was, you know, with the exception of a few things like Uriah, uh, the Hittite. He was doing it at God's uh, bidding. God still chose that someone else, not David, would be the one to build his temple. It would be David's son. So Solomon comes along, and David, according to Chronicles, did all the planning. David collected all the supplies that would be needed, all the materials, the jewels and the gold and the wood and everything else, and made the plans so that when Solomon was old enough and was getting ready to take over, David could turn that over to him. But um, Solomon was the one to build the temple. Here we have in 1 Kings 9, the Lord said to him, Solomon, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple, this is right after it's built, which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Now, God's promise here was given the obedience of the Israelites. When the Israelites turned away from God completely, including Judah, when the city of Jerusalem was to be destroyed, there's a very vivid picture in Jeremiah of the presence of the Lord rising up out of and away from the temple and departing. So God, in effect, said, I will always be there. My eyes and heart will always be there as long as you're faithful to me. When the Israelites proved completely unfaithful to God and the temple meant nothing to them anymore, God left. <coughs> and there's no indication after Herod rebuilt the temple, there is no record anywhere, nor even in any tradition, that the presence of God re-inhabited the temple in the same way he had the first time. Okay? And it continues, As for you, Solomon, if you walk before me faithfully, with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Well, that's as long as there was a throne of Israel. David's successors continued... You know, the last person to sit on the throne in Israel was uh, on the throne of Judah in the early 500s when it was destroyed by the Babylonians. When that throne is reestablished, there will be a descendant of David sitting on it, we believe, and that descendant of David will be Jesus. But if you or your descendants, here it comes, turn away from me and do not observe the commandments and decrees I've given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I've given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. And that's exactly what's hap what happens in Jeremiah. 
And there's a vivid picture. I mean, you only, you get this this image of the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, actually the glory of God, the Shekinah, which is what was resident in the temple. The Shekinah glory of God literally lifting up. You know, you almost get this helicopter kind of picture. And then departing away from the city of Jerusalem as it is being attacked to be destroyed. Okay? Um, a very you know, grievous um, moving image. Okay. Some people think that when it says that King David conquered the city of the Jebusites and established it as his capital and made it the city of David, that this was a big deal. We get this picture of the city of David today with all those walls. This is an aerial view, and this is what I was trying to draw for you the other day, um, Guillermo, because he was asking about that. This is an aerial view of what the... the city of Jerusalem would have been like back then. You'll notice it's got Christ's tomb, Calvary, question marks. There's two locations that it could be. They have different names for those. The Pool of Bethsaida. Now, these, this line here is the later wall that was built. Okay? When David conquered the city of the Jebusites, it was this area right here, this red circle. It's only 1,450 feet long and 400 feet wide. It's tiny. And yet it was fortified. This, um, this area here is one plateau, so it sits up off of the Kidron, this is the Kidron Valley. This is a low area. Over here, this would be what we know as the Mount of Olives, okay? So the Mount of Olives comes down steeply to the Kidron Valley, it goes back up steeply, and this had been a city that the Jebusites had. And they sat up there teasing and said, saying, the lame and the blind could defend the city from you, David, you're never going to get in here. Well, and next thing he says, and David conquered the city, and well, the way he apparently did it, Hezekiah's tunnel, the spring of Gihon, is a water source in the Kidron Valley. And they had designed a way to get that water up through Hezekiah's tunnel so that it was accessible inside the city of David, which means they didn't have to go outside of the water. Well, Hezekiah's tunnel has been expanded uh, several times. You can actually, if you're, if you're spelunker and you're really up for it, you can actually walk through Hezekiah's tunnel today. There, there are places that it gets, you know, this thick. So don't go in there if you're claustrophobic. But mm -hmm. um, it is Hezekiah, the king who came much later than David, was the one who expanded it and made it possible to traverse it. Actually, it was a, a huge um, archaeological, or a, I'm sorry, a, an engineering feat, because in order to take it from just a little trickle that they had access to, when he opened it up so that they could actually get in and out of it, um, they started on both ends, cutting through solid rock, and they met in the middle. All right. Well, this was done a long time ago. Anybody who knows anything about engineering know that if you start cutting through solid rock from two different directions and you want to meet in the middle, you better have figured it out. Well, they did. That's still there today. But this was the city of David. Then when Solomon came along, he expanded it upward. So the city, this, is, this is the Kidron Valley down here. This is a small promontory that literally sticks out, a small plateau, which was where the city of David was built. The next step up, and it's a plateau higher than that, is where the Temple Mount, as it's called today, was. So it's the next sort of level up that's flat, is this area. And they walled it in, and they put the temple there. This is where the temple was, with various gates, the horse gate, the, the gate of Benjamin, Later on, they added additional walls to make it bigger. Herod's palace is over here, so you had these things. And then later on, you know, they, they continued to expand it over a long period of time. The area, and we see the pictures of the gated city of Jerusalem right now. The city of David is actually outside that. It's no longer inside in the walled area, because the walls in, that we see of as the walls of Jerusalem were built like 200 years ago. They're nowhere near ancient in terms of like David and Solomon and all that stuff. But where, you get... Where's the eastern gate that's there now? Um, well, uh, I think that would be the horse gate. The horse gate? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, they put in... This was this was in the time of Solomon. But th there are all sorts of things. There's the Dung Gate now. There's the, the uh, uh, Golden Gate. Various gates into the city. Uh, the old city of Jerusalem. But again, these walls... The walls that you're thinking of now weren't there then. Those walls are new, and so um, the, the, there's a different, different kind of picture. But when it says that this was the fortress of the city of David, that when they turned to building the temple and the palace, 
they built in the next plateau up from that. This is one artist's conception, based upon the descriptions, of what the temple might have looked like. You can get a lot of different versions of this because it's not completely clear. I think there may be some pictures in your book, too. Um, it involved things like this giant, the molten sea, or it's a, it's a, it's, it's a huge uh, piece of bronze, which is supported by 12 bronze oxen facing an opposite three in each direction. And it, it, it holds an enormous amount of water. It's like a small swimming pool. We're not even really sure what that was used for. I mean, the idea of it be using it for a cleansing ritual. But the problem with that is that the Jews typically said that if you're going to use water for a cleansing ritual, it needs to be living water. That's where we get that expression, meaning that it's flowing, that it's not stagnant. It's not water you poured in a tub or something. It needs to be coming right off of a spring or a river or something of that sort. But there are various other labors and things of that sort. And, and you get an idea of the perspective. These are people, OK? So you get some idea how big this thing was. Huge. And then there are the two pillars on either side of the door. We don't know what the capitals were. They're named. Jachin and Boaz. Those two pillars are named. And apparently there was no purpose for them other than to have kind of a grand entrance. This is what the layout of the interior would have been. Uh, there were steps that led up in, in upper or inner court. Brazen altar here, and then you went into the actual building with Jochen and Boaz on either side. This is the molten sea that we were looking at, that big thing with the 12 oxen uh, holding it up. You go into the holy place, which was where, and it wasn't very big. The problem back then was the architectural capabilities did not allow them to build great giant buildings. They didn't have arches, for instance. Now the temple, um, Solomon's temple, would have been very substantial for its day. It would have been a very large building but not anywhere near large by our standards. Okay. Um, my guess is that the sanctuary in our new church will be bigger than the sanctuary would have been in, the, in this building. So the holy place, tables of shoe bread, there were uh, uh, candles, candle sticks all the way around. Um, there were folding doors here, and you'll notice all of these rooms are on the outside. There were rooms designed in the outside walls, apparently for various uses by the priest. They used them for storage rooms, sometimes would stay there, etc. And then the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. There was a veil separating the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place. Um, the only people who went in here, uh, the only person, was the High Priest. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was. Um, you guys saw, saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. They have one representative image of that. But the idea was that the two cherubim that were carved for the top of the Ark of the Covenant with their wings you know, touching in the center, that God literally, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God literally rested above the Ark of the Covenant. And so that was where the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in to offer atonement there. Um, so that was the holiest of places, quite literally, they believe, the place where God dwelt in their midst. Now, the Jews believe of God as being an omnipresent God, which means God's presence was everywhere, but in a very special way, he had promised that he would be resident there always. They always could look to the temple. They always could look to the place where the Holy of Holies and the Ark of Heaven was and know the presence of God was there. That's why that presence of God, when the Israelites left Egypt, and uh, you know, moved forward, the presence of God was visible in a tower of, a uh, pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Well, that same fire and cloud that represented the presence of the glory of God took residence there when the temple was dedicated. Okay? Any questions about that? I've got one more image for you, too. This is what it probably looked like from the outside. You know, this big courtyard area, which we looked at before, these covered areas, the colonnade, for instance, this was called the, the colonnade of Solomon. And the New Testament church, the book of Acts, would meet there. They would meet underneath this colonnade. Um, this, it was a series of courtyards, you know, that were concentric. And there were levels. The, the largest courtyard was the courtyard of the Gentiles. And Gentiles could go there. And that's where they sold, you know, they sold animals for sacrifice. And they changed money. And they did all those things that made Jesus so angry. Um, then there was the courtyard of women, which meant if you were a Jew, male or female, you could go in there. But only men were allowed in the inner courtyard, where the actual temple. Now, you see this building up here? That's one of the reasons I had this. This was built later by the Romans, so this is a later picture of it. Okay. Um, this 
would have been the uh, Fortress Antonia. It was the barracks where the Roman military were. And when Paul gets grabbed by Jews who are beating him up because they say he brought a Gentile into the temple, they literally could come out the door here and come right into the temple yards. And the, and the troops did to literally save Paul from being beaten to death. Okay, So you get a picture of that. And the new temple, Herod's temple, was built based upon, modeled on the original temple, but made probably big, the court, more courtyards, more outbuildings, more all of that sort of thing. But the basic principle was that it's supposed to have been uh, pretty much the same. Okay? Questions about any of that? Where is the Dome of the Rock in relationship to this now? Well, um, the Dome of the Rock would be right here, I think. I think the Dome of the Rock was actually on the site, because the temple, of course, is gone. The only part of the temple that remains today is the western wall, known as the Wailing Wall, which is a supporting wall on one side, and I can't tell you from this perspective where it would be. This whole area, during the when it was controlled by the Muslims, they built two, there actually are two mosques on this big elevated area called the Temple Mount. You can tell this area over there is lower, this area over here is lower. It literally is a mount, it's a, it's a plateau. Well, the Temple Mount, they built two mosques on. The one that everybody sees and knows about is the Golden Dome of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, or the Dome of the Rock, as it's called, because when you go in, have any of you all visited the Dome of the Rock? Um, if, when you go in there, the first impression you have is the smell of feet, because, of course, it's covered with carpets. The floor around the rock itself is covered with carpets, and people are, go barefoot, and so there's this sort of very salty, warm human smell that comes from all these rugs that have been there forever. Sneaky feet. And then in the middle, a very large rock. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. And this rock is said to be the site from which uh, Muhammad, aboard horseback, launched in his trip to heaven. Okay. And there's a there's a place on on the stone on the rock where there's what looks like a hoofprint, which is said to be the, what was left when the stallion. Mm -hmm. Miraculously, the stallion of Muhammad launched into heaven. But that's considered um, one of the very holiest sites for all Islam, after, after Mecca itself. Uh, Mecca and Medina are both considered holy sites, and then Jerusalem. Those are the three holy sites for Islam. Uh, so I think the Dome of the Rock would be somewhere in here, and then Al-Aqsa Mosque would be down, you know, on the, it's on the far end toward the city of David kind of place. Yes, Mike? Wasn't the, uh, wasn't, uh, was it? Abraham, when he took uh, Isaac to, to sacrifice him, wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to have been down that rock? It was said to be here as well. You know, this is this is uh, Mount Horeb. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a lot of biblical events that supposedly happened on the same site. The sacrifice of Isaac, which the um, the Muslims believe it was the sacrifice of Ishmael, not Isaac. Mm -hmm. okay. So <clears throat> those differences. Let's take a break. I want to give you some perspective. The temple itself, which is the, the temple, uh, is this part of it. Oh. I pushed the wrong button again. This part, you know, what you see here, um, that is just this part. Okay, these are the courts around it. This part itself, um, we're not really sure how big a cubit was. Notwithstanding um, Bill Cosby's famous Noah routine. Okay, what's a cubit? If you don't, don't know that. Quite some time. But we don't know exactly, but we've got a pretty good idea that it was about a foot and a half. It's about two cubits to a yard, in other words. Gem is the best we can tell. Which means the biblical description of this as being 60 cubits long, 90 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. It was probably somewhere between 90 and 100 feet long, 33 feet wide, and 49 or so feet high. As you can see, it's a tall building. Okay. Now that's not very big by our standards, but that was a very big building back in those days. Um, so, just to give you some perspective on that. So we have, we have Solomon, I showed you this map before. This green area is the area that Saul controlled and made, in Saul's day that was the united uh, monarchy of Israel. David comes along, takes a deep breath, and conquers all of this area that's outlined in purple. Pretty much everything except Philistia, you know, the, the Philistines continue to give him problems, 
Um, Ammon, Moab, and Edom were all subjects. They were conquered, they were subject to David, but they still retained some identity. So you'll notice they're inside this, but they still had some of their own, um, they were still Edomites. You know, the Book of Ruth, uh, Moabites. They were still a sense in which the people were identified, even though they were conquered. And then Saul comes along, and Saul was not a man of blood. Saul did not fight battles, for the most part. There was a little bit of stuff going on, but for the most part, Saul's efforts were uh, political and a matter of influence. And so Saul added this area up here, which was the land of Soba, all the way up to the Euphrates River, in terms of economic control. This is one of the reasons that, Saul, that uh, Solomon started marrying other women, because, and why these were foreign women. Because in those days, the way you struck a treaty with somebody is you had a marriage. And since you now were related by a bond of marriage, you didn't go to war with each other. And so Solomon took this to heart <laughs> 700 times. He married women from the various foreign areas around him, and in doing so, he established <coughs> relations with them. He had wives who were Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites. Even though those were part of his kingdom, they were still a distinct people, and there was always a danger they could want to you know, rise up. Well, as long as one of their own was one of the queens, one of Solomon's wives, they would be much less likely to do that. And then they were having children, which meant that they had people of their bloodline were the children of the ruling king, Solomon, and so they had a connection. Um, and that was true all the way around here. Okay, So he, the first wife that we have record that he took was from down in Egypt. Okay, uh, was a daughter of Pharaoh. Actually, there's a redundancy in the way it's written. It says, the daughter of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. Well, Pharaoh means ruler. And it's like the ruler, ruler. The Pharaoh is not his name. Bob? Um, question about that temple. Was that temple more or less contemporaneous with uh, the temple of Artemis and some of those other temples? Or were those much later than this temple? Um, the temple Artemis would have been around the same time. Um, and when we say it's a bigger building, the reason that the Temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is its, its size, its scale. Um, the Greeks were much more sophisticated in building, although the Greeks never invented the arch. But the thing about the Temple of Artemis is it had like close to 400 pillars that held the roof up. So because the, the Greeks never invented the arch, the only thing they had was, you know, was uh, posts and lentils. And so you had to put them close enough together that this, the lintel, the, the cross piece, which was made out of stone, wasn't stretched so far that it would collapse. And so the way they did it, when you walk into, and you even get that sense if you go to the Parthenon, on the Acropolis in, in Greece, and you see all of, the, all of the columns around the outside, well, those columns would have continued inside too. Because the only way they could build big buildings like that is if they put the pillars close together all the way through the building. Sort of like our little church here, where we've got people who get pole positions where they can't see what's happening because they've got a post right in front of them. Um, this is one of the reasons why Samson was able to push apart the pillars and bring down the roof of the Temple of Dagon uh, and kill all the Philistine people because the pillars were were close enough together that one man could reach from you know big man could reach from one to the other. And when God gave him back his strength, he was able to push them apart. So, yeah, there were bigger buildings. This building, I mean, the, the temple was intended, they actually had services and stuff in there. So it wasn't just one pillar after another pillar, like it was in a lot of buildings. Um, and therefore, there was a, a very strict limit as to how big they could make it without thinking the roof was going to cave in. Yes? Well, I was just wondering if this temple was one of the motivations might have been to rival some of these other temples. It's very possible. Certainly, they they went way uh, as far as they could possibly go with decoration. The whole it was made out of cypress and cedar, cypress floor, cedar walls. But the interior of the temple was entirely coated in gold, and the panels before they coated them in gold um, were all carved. The interior was entirely carved, and they have very very specific descriptions in First Kings what they were carved like. Pomegranates, very popular. Lots of pomegranates, lots of flowers, lots of leaves, 
So throughout all of it, and then they would have chains that would connect various pieces of it. Sometimes they would have wild animals, bulls and other things, like the bulls that hold up the molten sea outside. And so they carved all of this stuff, the finest of craftsmen. They in embedded some of it with precious stones. They, they did gold covering, gold leaf covering over much of it. And so they did everything imaginable to try to decorate this place. In fact, later on when Ezra, the Ezra Nehemiah book, it's one book in the Tanakh, when, when the first of them go back to rebuild the temple and they start rebuilding it, we read what sounds a little funny to us these days about how they were all grieving and about the fact that it was such a dorky little building compared to what the original temple had looked like because they didn't have those kind of resources even though the king had told the governor provide them whatever they need they didn't have all that gold and all those jewels and everything they had building materials but they didn't have all of the wealth and they probably didn't have the capability to build this bigger building and so what they built when Ezra went back was apparently pretty lame compared to what it had been then Herod the Great comes along. And as crazy as Herod was, he's one of the most important builders in the ancient world. I mean, everything he did was spectacular. He built the harbor at Caesarea Maritima. I mean, he, he had them create a kind of concrete that they could that they'd pour, take these rafts out, pour them full of this concrete, sink the raft, and the concrete was capable of being uh, solidifying underwater. And so he literally created Using, using Roman concrete stuff, created a man-made harbor. Um, he, a bunch of other structures, you know, the Temple of Masada and everything else, he was extraordinary in terms of his vision and his capabilities. One of the things he did was he rebuilt the temple. The second temple period was the period of Herod the Great, <coughs> between um, the 70 years or so between about the time Jesus was born, Herod was there, up until the destruction in AD 70 by the Romans. <coughs> and the Herodian temple was said to be more spectacular than the Solomon's temple was. So he really did it right because he did have virtually unlimited resources and he didn't care who got killed in the process. So he created an extraordinary temple. Um, but it's very likely, as you said, that they wanted to make sure that they had a temple which would rival in appearance the temple of Dagon or the temple of Chemosh or the temple of, Mo uh, the temple of Moloch or any of those others. So they did a spectacular job of decorating it, even though they couldn't make it that big, simply because there were limits to their architectural capabilities. All right? Okay. This gives you an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, let's talk about the book of 2 Kings. Again, 2 Kings would have been the, last, the, the, the rest of 1 Kings. It is all one book in the Hebrew Bible. So same traditional author, same traditional date. Uh, the, the Jewish tradition is this Jeremiah, and that's possible given when Jeremiah lived and what he wrote about. The story here is the story of the two divided kingdoms. Now, um, first kings, the first half of it is the United Kingdom under Solomon, and then it's split under Solomon's son Rehoboam and his, and his rival Jeroboam. But then we get into a much more extensive semi-historical. Again, there's a theological motivation. It's not history the way you think of it, but it does tell the story of all the kings. And you'll notice, in fact, it does kind of a leapfrogging thing through here. It will say, you know, Omri was the king of Israel. And in the 14th year of Omri, uh, Asa became, and I don't remember that's the exact name, Asa, in the 13th year of Omri, Asa became the king of Judah. You know, in the ninth year of uh, Asa, you know, such and such, uh, Amaziah became the king of Israel. And so, they keep referring to the kings coming along. The, the historical notes are based upon when other kings were there. Now, the two divided kingdoms, we have the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elijah are not the only prophets referred to in here. We have Nathan. We have a number of prophets that are not referred to by name. We have 400 prophets at one point. So, but we have a number that are named, and so there's a lot of prophetic stuff going on, prophets coming along. And remember, a prophet is not necessarily, it could be, but not necessarily somebody who tells the future, according to God. It's somebody who speaks the word of God. It could just as much be for today, or it could even be an interpretation of something that's happened in the past that God wants to use as, as a, a teaching tool. A prophet is one who speaks for God, whether it has to do with a future event or not. So, the prophets Elijah and Elisha are two of the most important 
um, non-literary prophets, or pre-literary prophets, as we sometimes call them. There's two big categories. That you got divide this a bunch of ways. You can talk about you know, major prophets and minor prophets. You can talk about former prophets and latter prophets. But one way to think about them also is there are literary prophets and pre-literary prophets. The earliest prophets, as important as they were, Nathan may have written some stuff, but there's no book of Nathan. We're told, actually, Nathan did write some things, and that may have been part of the source for some other writings. But you get people like Nathan, very, very important, did not write a book in the Bible. Elijah and Elisha, two of the truly great prophets, both of whom were in there fighting the good fight against Ahab and some of the other really bad guys in the north, and yet they never wrote books for us. Later on, you get the literary prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, etc. Uh, but these guys come along, and they're in there speaking for God, speaking judgment. Uh, for instance, uh, Elijah tells Ahab that for the sin that he has committed in, um, against God, that the dogs will lick up his blood, and the dogs will eat Jezebel in the city. Well, sure enough, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom get together to go to war, and in the process of the war, and it's, you know, the, the southern king is uh, Jehoshaphat at that point. Jump in Jehoshaphat, that's where that comes from. Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Well, Ahab tells Jehoshaphat, you wear your robes so everybody can see you, and I'm going to dress like an ordinary soldier. And Jehoshaphat went along with it. I mean, who would have been the target in that situation, right? But Jehoshaphat is unscathed. Ahab is struck by an arrow and tells his chariot driver to take him back. He ends up dying, bleeding to death in the chariot, and it says they take the chariot back to clean it, and the dogs are licking up Ahab's blood as it drips off of the chariot where he died. So the prophecy was fulfilled. And later on, Jezebel is killed in the city. We don't actually have a picture of the dogs eating her, but you, know, you get the idea. Um, and it was, you know, the, these guys were the prophetic voice, and when necessary, a hard prophetic voice to bring them around. Now, they're fascinating guys. There's wonderful stories about these guys. Um, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, one of the coolest stories in the whole Bible, where Elijah, of course, is speaking out against the worship of Baal. Now, the, the Ahab and Jezebel king and queen of the northern kingdom of Israel. And they're worshiping the Canaanite gods. Baal literally means lord or husband lord. And so all of the fertility gods were called the Baals. Well, the, the prophets of Baals and the priests of Baal, there were hundreds of them. And Elijah challenges them. He says, okay, you think your god is a real god. I know my god is a real god. But let's have a little context. Let's go up on Mount Carmel, which today if you go to the city of Haifa, Carmel is the ridge, the, the very high ridge of hills that go parallel to the coast in the city of Haifa. You, you literally can go up there and look down on all of Haifa and the Mediterranean Sea and the whole thing. That ridge of mountains is Mount Carmel. Well, that, they went up on Carmel, and Elijah says, all right, let's build two altars. One for you guys and your God, one for my God. And, you know, let's prepare the altars and let's put wood on them and everything else. And he said, you can go first. Call out to your God, and whichever God, your God or my God, brings fire to consume the sacrifice, we'll know that's the real God. And they say, okay. They then go all afternoon. The, God, the prophets of Baal, the priests of Baal, are screaming out to Baal to respond. They're banging gongs. They're beating drums. They're cutting themselves and bleeding and yelling and screaming. The whole time, Elijah's trash talking. He's saying, what's wrong? Is your God gone? Is he on vacation? Is he indisposed? Maybe he's in the toilet, is what he's implying. Um, or is he asleep? Do you need to scream louder so you can wake him up? The whole time this is going on, Elijah's standing there trash talking these guys. Now remember, the king and, and queen, the people with power, are on the side of the prophets of Baal. Well, they go for hours, apparently, and no success. And Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. They cut up the bull, they put it on the altar, and Elijah says to some of the people there, said, okay, I want you to go get buckets of water and pour it over the wood and the sacrifice, and there was a trench around, and they filled the trench with water, and they soaked the thing. He goes, okay, do it again. I want to make sure this thing is absolutely soaked. They soak it with water again. You know, there's water filling the trench. And Elijah says, God, show them. 
I mean, that's almost as much as he says. He says a little bit more than that. Show him that you are God. Lightning, fire comes from heaven. It says it consumes not only the sacrifice and all of the wet wood and the altar. It even the fire even licks up the water from the trench that had been dug around it. And Elijah says to the civilians that are standing there, "See, now are you going to let them keep lying to you?" And so they grab all the prophets of Baal and the priests of Baal who were there, four hundred of them, and kill them. The local people kill all these, these priests. Well, Jezebel is fit to be tied because these were her people. She fed them. She, she, she paid them. She, they, she took care of them. They were her priests. When she finds out this has happened, she sends word to Elijah and says, you know, may God kill me, you know, the gods kill me if I don't do to you before the end of the day what you did to them. And so Elijah, and again, this is one of those cases where Elijah, one of the most important prophets of the Old Testament, uh, spectacular stories, and yet he's scared, and he runs away, and he goes out into the desert fleeing Jezebel, and sits down and says, you know, I've done the best I can, God, but just kill me. And God says, oh, Elijah, come on, you know, and so, and there's these wonderful stories. And again, if, if the point of these scriptures was to sell us a bill of goods, then that would not, they would have left us with the picture of Elijah you know, defeating the 400 prophets of Baal. They didn't. They just let us see his very, his very broken, his very weak side as well. Okay, wonderful stories about these guys. The purpose to teach that unfaithfulness to God will lead to righteous discipline. Again, there's the first 16 verses deal with the divided kingdom, then the fall of Israel in the north. The northern kingdom of Israel, in fact, I'll, I'll show you that, but the northern kingdom, every king in the north was a bad guy in terms of not worshiping God. That's why they kept having one family after another, you know, assassinations and, and you know, uh, political shenanigans, and they couldn't stay on the throne. In fact, they went through more than twice as many kings in the north as they did during the same time in the south. All of the southern kings of Judah were descendants of David, and some of them were really good Kings like Hezekiah. You'll notice the fall of Israel in the north, 722 B.C. God finally got fed up with the fact that the kingdom of Israel in the north were completely uh, away from him. They had not followed God. They were worshiping these other gods. And part of the reason, one of the reasons for that, is that, that uh, Jeroboam, when he became the first king of the north, he no longer, no longer had access to the temple in Jerusalem. So he had to come up as the king. He was responsible for coming up with some way for his people to worship. Well, rather than say, we will have a temple where we worship the one true God, and God spoke to him and said, if you'll follow me, then I'll bless you too. Jeroboam instead said, let's make two golden calves and set one of them up at Dan in the north and one of them up at the town in the south, and that people can come to those two towns and worship these idols, the idols that brought them up out of captivity in Egypt. He tried to steal God's credit with these idols. From that point on, the northern kings led their people to follow false gods. And part of it is because without access to the temple of Jerusalem, Jeroboam had made the completely wrong choice as to how do I deal with this, not being able to get to the temple anymore. Okay? So, in 722, the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed by Assyria. Um, then the surviving kingdom of Judah, and we're told their story because Judah was still around because they had some good kings. At the same time, the same period, when Assyria destroys the northern kingdom of Israel, the king, um, Sennacherib was his name, the king of Assyria, then comes south and conquers a number of the cities of the southern kingdom of Judah, the walled cities, sends his representative, who comes up to the wall outside Jerusalem and is shouting, you know, you're next, you better give up, you better surrender right now, and Hezekiah, who is the king, he is a good king. He is a king that had gotten rid of a lot of the false worship in the south. He wasn't overly strong. He waffled some. He, if he had a failing, it was that he was too, too quick to want to jump into a political uh, relationship, a political affiliation in order to try to protect his kingdom rather than rely on God. But he was one of the better ones. Hezekiah is wondering, what am I going to do? Should I give up? Isaiah the prophet Isaiah is present there. Isaiah in, in Jerusalem says to Hezekiah, Do not give up, king. 
because the Lord our God will save us from this situation. And they, you know, they send word that, well, you know, no, we, we believe our God will protect us. And the guy who's the representative of King Sennacherib says, well, then why didn't, and he goes through a long list of other gods that other cities had worshipped. Well, this God didn't help them, and that God didn't help those guys, and these people worship this God, and that God didn't help them. Are you really sure your God's going to do this? Well, the next morning, they woke up, and 185,000 Assyrians were dead. And they decided to go home. Actually, in the annals of the Assyrian kings, Sennacherib is, uh, the story is told that Sennacherib says, that he conquered so many cities in uh, the kingdom of, after destroying the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, he conquered so many cities, and he penned King Hezekiah up in his city like a bird. The Assyrian documents don't say that he conquered Hezekiah, which is completely consistent from a different political perspective, but completely factually consistent with the biblical story that the Assyrians died and, and the, the the non-religious historians say, well, it must have been a plague. Yeah, like Ebola. It killed them overnight. Um, and they went home, and Sennacherib, having left, apparently was dishonored to the extent that a short time later, two of his sons approached him in, in the temple where they worshipped and killed him. He was assassinated by his own sons. So, but the, the faith of Hezekiah, sort of reluctant faith, at the strong... Uh, push from Isaiah did not give in to the Assyrians, who had already conquered the northern kingdom and a lot of other places, and ended up holding out. Well, Hezekiah was a good king. His son Manasseh came along. Manasseh was one of the worst ever. He undid all the good things that Hezekiah had done. He reestablished places to worship the Baals. A terrible guy. And God's anger is against him. And then Manasseh, after a career as king, had a son Amnon, didn't change. He went along with his father's ideas. And then they had a son, Josiah. Josiah was only eight years old when he became king. By this time, it clearly is. You know, the kingship has passed down. There's no longer a question about that here. Um, and when Josiah took over, and he had people helping him, as it's, when he was still very young, he decided that I'm going to believe in my great-grandfather's idea, Manasseh's idea, or uh, I'm sorry, Hezekiah's idea, and we're going to worship the one true God. And he started a reform. The most complete reform of any of the kings of this time period, where he got rid of, he cut down the Asherah poles, the worship of the, the, the uh, female version of the Baals. He got rid of the altars on the high places. He destroyed them. In fact, what he did was he did not only had the altars destroyed, but then he took the bones of the priests of the Baals that were killed, and he had their bones burned, and the ashes were scattered in the sites of the, the altars, which means they were polluted, they were considered unusable in the future by even the Baals. And he was very serious about this. Well, during this time period, a lot of stuff's happening. Assyria is beginning to decline in power. Egypt is beginning for the, the umpteenth time to rise in power. Um, Babylon is beginning to come up. Now, Assyria had controlled Egypt and Babylon at one time. But it ends up being this sort of jockeying, and the question had been, who do you side with? Because Assyria had been such a threat, um, the, the Babylonians and the Assyrians were fighting. The Egyptians come up from the south because they had sort of allied with the Assyrians at one point. They're going to come up from the south and defeat the Babylonians. The Babylonians were the enemy of the Assyrians. Well, the enemy, my enemy, is my friend. Josiah goes out to try to stop the Egyptian army under Pharaoh Necho coming up from the south to fight the Babylonians because he thinks, leave them alone, if the Babylonians defeat the Assyrians, that's good for us. Turned out not to be. But he thought that. Well, Josiah is killed in the battle with Pharaoh Necho. And so that leadership goes away. And later on, 586 BC, Babylon, who has grown in power, has conquered Egypt, has conquered Assyria. They take over and they end up between uh, 600 and 586. There's actually three different times Babylon comes in, you know, takes, they have three different deportations where they take people off. This is where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up in Babylon. It's during this time period, one of the deportations. Um, and so finally in 586, because of rebellion by the, by the king that they put in place, they come in, they destroy the city of Jerusalem, they tear it apart, they destroy the temple, they burn it, 
right before they actually destroy the temple is when Jeremiah has the, the vision of the Shekinah glory of God lifting up and leaving the temple area. And the judgment, the judgment against the, uh, the kingdom of Israel in the north by the Assyrians in 722, and then later the judgment against the, the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 by the Babylonians, both of those are clearly identified as being judgments against them for their failure to worship God. Josiah, when he came in and he was trying to do all the right things after having his father and grandfather having been the worst in the south, Manasseh and Amnon, um, the prayer is, God, will you, re will you relent? Will you, you know, not destroy us the way you did the northern kingdom because we're trying? And the prophecy comes through the prophetess, a woman, hold up. She prophesies, no, the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom is, is done. You know, Yes, I appreciate the effort you've made in your great-grandfather, uh, Hezekiah, but there's been too much turning away, and there's too much the hearts of the people have been guided away. Because in those days, the king was the one responsible for leading the worship. If the king decided we're going to start worshiping some other god, the people almost naturally followed it. So the king was the one responsible if things went haywire in terms of worship. Okay? This gives you, I mean, you saw the picture a minute ago of what it looked like when it was a united kingdom under David, first Saul, then David, then Solomon. When they split, you've got the kingdom of Israel up here and the kingdom of Judah. The reason Israel was bigger is because it was 10 of the 12 tribes. And because the division of the land was according to needs, there was more property under those 10 tribes. The kingdom of Judah was mostly the tribe of Judah and then a little bit of Benjamin right up here. There's sort of a small area that was the tribe of Benjamin. Um, this gives you another picture, the northern kingdom of Israel, which comes down here and goes up. That's the same as the previous one. And you'll notice all these different colors. Those are all the different tribes. Down here, while you do have part of Ephraim, they sided with the north, and, and Ephraim then moved up here. You've got Benjamin, you've got Judah here. That was the southern kingdom, all right? Um, this, again, this is online for you, so you can go on and look at this. This is from one of those books I have that allows me to make copies, as long as I don't do it for profit. This shows up here the dates and the names of the three kings under the united monarchy. That is Saul, David, and Solomon. Then we have the divided kingdom, with, starting with Rehoboam and his son uh, Bijam here, and then Jeroboam and his son uh, Nadab. And then these are a bunch of different families. All of these are descendants of David, down to Zedekiah, who was the last, who was carried off in one of the ex into exile at the end. Um, but in 722, Israel falls to Assyria. In 586, Judah is carried off to Babylon, destroyed by the Babylonians. Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. And then this tells you, <coughs> excuse me, who the prophets were during that time. That is the literary prophets especially. We've got Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. And then after the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians, and Cyrus the Great gives permission to the Jews, and not just the Jews, but other people that were under his control, permission to go back to their homeland and, and rebuild. Then you have leaders Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah were the ones that were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And that's during the time of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so when we talk about Ezra and Nehemiah, we'll be looking at the time of the return of the building. So this little chart gives you a perspective in terms of the years, who the various kings were in the north and the north, the south and the north, who the uh, various prophets were. And you can access that online. Any questions about that? Yes? I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Where is the, the house of Salomon? Is it the temple or is it near to the temple? The palace was just below it. Uh, back in the original, okay, everybody close your eyes. Because I don't want to Here. Um, yeah. Temple, royal palace. So it was just below it, in between the city of David and the temple. Okay. And the Solomon big uh, temp Mount temple, no, is a uh, palace? palace? Spectacular it's, palace. Is, is it the red part? Yes. Well, no, no. His palace is right here. Ah, uh, here. Yeah. So right next to the temple was the royal palace. Uh, it would, to give you an idea, it would have probably, you know, this doesn't show up, but it would have been down here, right next door, okay. to where the courts were. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one second, Mike. Yeah. The south uh, 
the so the so part of Israel or Judah. Uh -huh. They have uh, Jerusalem like a temple. Yes. And in the north, in the north, the capital city was Samaria. That's why you get the Good Samaritan and you get the woman you know of Samaria in Jesus' time. Well, the Samaria Samaria was the the city that they established as their capital. And then they established a place of worship on, this, on the mountain right outside the capital of Samaria. When Jesus meets with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and is talking to her, and he says, you know, the Jews worship, uh, in, the, in the conversation they say the Jews worship at the temple in Jerusalem, but our, she says, our forefathers were told that we worship here on, uh, on, the mount, on this mountain, right above the city of Samaria. And that was one of the high places where... And the, What's that? It's not a temple. No, it's not, it's not a temple to God. Um, although later, uh, the Samaritans, and there still are Samaritans, by the way. There are a few hundred of them that still exist. The thing the Assyrians did when they conquered the northern kingdom, Assyria was the cruel. When you look at Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Hittites, all of these different peoples, none of them were as cruel or as, as uh, professional in their conquering <laughs> as the Assyrians. One of the things the Assyrians did is they killed most of the people. But any that they thought they could use for slaves, or that, you know, somebody's still got to farm the land and do all that stuff. You take over more land, you need more people to take care of it. So they would come in and they would take all the people that lived in a conquered area, and they would move them somewhere else that they conquered. And they would take the people from that other conquered place, and they would bring them in there. Well, what happened is, this area, all of the, the Jews that lived there, almost all of them, were taken off into captivity elsewhere in the Assyrian kingdom. And other captives were brought in there. Well, it ended up later, some of the Jews came back, they intermarried. So the reason the Jews did not like the Samaritans is because the Samaritans were half-breeds. They were half-Jewish and half-something else that the Assyrians brought in and forced off. And they had developed a, a mishmash religion that was part Judaism and part something else. And so to this day, there's a Samaritan version of the Bible, which is quite different. They've got 11 commandments, for instance. In fact, the 11th commandment is that God, they were instructed by God to worship on Mount Gerizim, right outside Samaria. So they added to the Bible, the Old Testament Bible, um, what they thought was necessary in order for them to be justified in their, in their work, you know, in, their, in their worship. So you get an idea. That's why the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. They thought they were a... a Mixed up religion and they were a mixed up race. They weren't pure Jews and their religion was not true Judaism. Okay? Now, a couple of other things I want to show you. Uh, first, this, well, this verse is about Assyria invading the land, 2 Kings 17. This, I wanted to give you an image of what Assyria looked like at its height. The Assyrian Empire went into Asia Minor, they had conquered the Hittites. It went up north almost to the Black Sea all the way over, you know, into uh, Iraq, Iran, and th the only reason they didn't talk the Arabian Desert is why. Okay, there's nothing there, quite literally, nothing there. And so they had conquered the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers here, which was the richest area between the Euphrates and Tigris. They conquered all of the Levant, the area that we know of as Israel or Palestine. They had conquered all of Egypt that was worth conquering. Again, you conquer the Nile River Valley, and you've got the only part that's inhabited. You get out here or out here, it's desert. You know, there's nobody there uh, except some monks. Um, and so this was the Assyrian Empire, one of the great empires in terms of size, power, authority in its day. Then you get into 2 Kings 25, and I will read this part. The northern kingdom is destroyed by the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians. That's why they control all of this, right? But Jerusalem, actually some maps have a little, a little circle there that's not the same color because they did not conquer Jerusalem. Hezekiah held out because Isaiah told him to and 180,000 or 185,000 Assyrians died outside the walls. So there was a little island of not, not being controlled by Assyria right around Jerusalem. Then you get this. On the seventh day of the fifth month of the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the commander of the imperial guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army and the, the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Uh, Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace, 
and those who had gone over to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and the fields. So Judah, that is the southern kingdom of Judah, went into captivity away from her land. This is when the southern kingdom in 586 is destroyed by Babylon. Now they started right around 600. They actually had defeated them and taken some people into captivity. Then they came back later and defeated them again and took some more people into captivity. This is when they finally decided to just finish the job and destroy the city and carry everybody off except for the few people who needed to form the land. And so this is the Babylonian Empire. They actually didn't have the good sense not to try to conquer the Arabian Desert, so they're, they're, you know, they include that. But you will notice the outline looks very similar, because they conquered the Assyrian Empire. They're, they went a little further into the Hittite Empire in, in Asia Minor. This is what we call Turkey. Uh, but pretty close to the same kind of boundaries uh, that the, the Assyrian Empire had. They conquered the Levant, again, they were a little further down, but they conquered the Nile River the Valley in the same way that the Assyrians had. So the Babylonians conquered Assyria, they conquered the southern kingdom of Judah in 586, and destroyed it, took them off into exile. Okay? Questions about any of that? In both cases, it wasn't just they came along and they were really strong and they conquered. The story we have, which... I for one believe, is that the defeat of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians in 722 BC and the defeat of the southern kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians in 586 BC, both were a direct result of their failure to be obedient to God, of worshiping other gods, and so the judgment of God. All peoples were made by God, God can use any of them as instruments, in fact there's some interesting things when the prophecies are given that God will send the Assyrians, people respond like, what? The Assyrians? Certainly God wouldn't use the Assyrians. They're horrible. And the answer is, God can use whoever he wants because he made them all. And so he used Assyria. He used Babylon. Next week we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to look at the Chronicles, but we're going to get into an introduction to the Persian Empire, which was the next one to come along. After the Persians get Alexander the Great in the Greek Hellenistic period. But the Persians conquered all of this. All right? they're, uh, they're, the capital of the Assyrians had been in Asher and then Nineveh. The capital of Babylonians, of course, had been Babylon. But there's another city right over here, the city of Susa, which is the city where the book of Esther takes place. Because Esther became queen. She was Jewish. She became one of the queens of the king of Persia. And so Cyrus the Great, enlightened compared to the, you know, the Shalmaneser V and Tiglath the III the and all these guys with really cool names that controlled the uh, Assyrians or the Babylonians. He let them go back. And he didn't have prejudice against marrying somebody who was a Jew, for instance. And so he married Esther, a beautiful Jewish woman. And the story of the book of Esther takes place in the capital city of Persia, and has to do with an attempt to destroy the Jewish people and how God solves that problem. Next week we'll talk a little bit as we talk about Chronicles about the Persian, because that will prepare us for the time of Ezra and Nehemiah as well. Any questions about any of that? There is an outline that we didn't go through, but that's multiple pages. If you want to have a complete outline, you, you may, if you said I have a study Bible, you'll have some version of this. That line is where First and Second Kings split but it's the same story, and so it continues. All of this stuff, I typed all of that in just for you. <laughs> okay? So if you, I, I encourage you to go online and use this stuff. And then last, remove the remnant to Egypt and the elevation of Jehoiakim and Babylon. In fact, the fact that the last message in 2 Kings is that the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, who had been taken out in the second Babylonian deportation. Zedekiah was the last king taken out in the third um, Babylonian deportation, but actually taken out. He ran for it, they caught him, they killed his sons in front of his eyes, tore out his, uh, tore out his eyes, and took him to imprisonment. But the fact that Je Je uh, Jehoiakim, the last living king of Judah, the end of the book says that after many, many years of being in prison, he was released and was treated like a guest and given an allowance and given good clothes, didn't have to wear prison clothes anymore, and allowed to eat at the king's table. 
is seen as a prophetic, um, a nugget of prophetic hope. That for all of the destruction and all of all of that stuff happening, the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, uh, the deportation of the people, the last message in Kings is, but the king was released from prison and treated well. And it's as though that's just a little glimmer that there is still hope for all of that. Now the Babylonian exile had a huge impact in terms of the Jewish people's understanding of their religion, of themselves as a people. We'll talk about that a little bit next week as we talk about, uh, about Chronicles and as we just get a little bit of a picture of what uh, Persia was like before we get into the, the story of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Any questions? I have no clue whether I have been sensible today or not because I'm only half conscious. So, you know, this is like five hours of two days. So, um, thank you very much. I will see you next week.